so I come out of uh, working on the Digital Youth Project, which was this three-year uh, ethnographic uh, research project with many different researchers trying to understand just in a very sort of descriptive way what are kids doing today with digital media. And that's sort of how I cut my teeth with uh, learning how to do ethnographic methods and really trying to understand um, a more on-the-ground perspective of how kids are growing up today and how media and technology is part of that. And coming out of that, I'd done two projects. One was in uh, rural California, and the other was in Brooklyn. And, you know, we were trying to look very broad-based, but not too much at questions of sort of difference amongst kids and not too much at sort of inequality issues. And both of my sites were more on the sort of, um, had quite a few kids who came from less uh, privileged backgrounds and some of our other sites were in places like Silicon Valley or just t t tended to be more affluent and kids were very plugged in. So I started getting interested um, in questions about inequality as my dissertation was coming up. What I started doing is looking at the literature about how does inequalities, how do they persist and get reproduced between generations. And for me the real question is, all right, how is digital media playing into that? Are things just all the same? Are they different? Uh, is, it make, is digital media making it worse? When? How? Is it making, you know, is it ameliorating some of these inequalities, when and how? I don't think it's as simple as the technology, digital media as a whole, having some sort of impact one way or the other. Um, I think there's exciting cases where you see opportunities for, uh, you know, kind of breaking or going around some of these structural constraints. And I think a lot of people in the digital media, uh, media, uh, digital media and learning initiative are interested in trying to identify those. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of ways that uh, digital media can be used uh, to reproduce these inequalities and sometimes even make them worse. Um, and so I think it's important that we pay attention to when that's happening as well. But down the road, and so uh, alongside that, I'm going to stay involved. Uh, I'll be working with Mimi this year a little bit to, uh, on some new research, um, probably in New York. And going forward, I think I'll look at academic work. Um, the, the, my kind of goal is to stay what I'm told my kind of colleagues here this week to find a way to stay in the game, so to speak, meaning that sort of within the research community, um, hopefully continuing to address uh, these kind of questions of how digital media is tied up in questions of reproducing inequality or not, but from a much more on the ground perspective. So what tends to happen is, you know, I did this year long project for my dissertation research and, you know, I feel like I'm beginning to understand this in more concrete ways and that opens up a whole new set of questions and also opportunities. So you begin to see, uh, ways where there's those kind of moments of hope where maybe something could uh, be, you know, the, the, these, the, the, these kind of openings. So I'm also curious to see, and you know, who knows if this will be possible, but working more with people who are on the intervention side and design side to try to see if there's ways to kind of push on those, those openings, as well as kind of ringing the bell when I see, uh, you know, if it feels like it's actually being used to sort of reproduce inequities in ways we maybe didn't intend. So, so I think a big part of what's happened this week is bringing together people who are at a relatively early stage in their sort of research careers, but that share this interest and don't have a chance to really get to know each other um, on a sort of face-to-face -face level. And then the other, uh, the other thing that's been going on is that there's been opportunities to um, sort of see and hear from people who are further along in their careers and how they go about that the sort of art of the of the trade, the tricks of the trade, so to speak. And so to kind of bridge between people who, that sort of uh, lateral cohort building, and then also, um, you know, seeing how people who have done been through it already, how they did it, and, you know, it's, there's both learning from that, and then also, uh, you know, the healthy amount of suspicion and wanting to do things a little bit differently than the generation ahead of you, and, you know, that kind of healthy uh, questioning, and while also trying to learn how this all works. Well, let me give you two, um, because one is more personal, maybe not for the for the internet or whatever. So, one of our colleagues, um, in giving his presentation, uh, just kind of really opened up on a very personal level uh, with us in a way that I think is fairly rare when you're in a professional setting. And I think it was actually uh, really refreshing and actually really good for the group. And um, and that was a risky thing for him to do. So like, uh, that was a very memorable moment. And I think it kind of reminded people like why each of us I think has our own kind of uh, reasons for being involved in this work and frustrations and things as kind of whole people um, that don't always surface in like when you're at conferences or when you're obviously when you're writing. Uh, and this was actually, a, this kind of came up around writing and what, how much of yourself you can 
reveal in your academic writing. You present yourself in a very uh, kind of distanced way, and that's changed to some degree over the time, but it still has this sort of distanced, authoritative voice that is supposed to kind of come through in, in your writing. And I think, uh, you know, that to a certain extent, that's a, you know, that's a fallacy, and it hides a big part of who people are. So just having that moment where he was very willing to be kind of open and exposed with us, uh, I think it did a lot to make us kind of relate to each other as humans and not just as professional colleagues. I think that people have felt a general sense that they're a part of something, which uh, again is normally distributed and fairly abstract and it, you're kind of interfacing with it by reading things or perhaps writing stuff and contributing it, but it's um, there's something about actually sitting around a table or even being in a van with a group of other people where you, you know, there's a sense of belonging and sort of uh, camaraderie. And then, you know, again, linking up with more uh, senior people who have kind of already passed through some of these things that you're about to go through, uh, and just being at the same table. Um, I think that that has you know, lasting effects on people's kind of sense of like, okay, I see how I can fit into this, and there's a place here instead of it just being sort of this abstraction where you send off things into the ether and get it back and with comments on it, if that makes sense.